Shaw. I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around Our World on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, Moana Nui Akea. Today's episode is focusing on peace and human rights education for all. Humanity's New Year's resolution is human rights education, Article 19, Freedom of Expression for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Today, I'm joined by two amazing guests, and I'm very excited for them to share about the work that they do, because peace and human rights education really does serve as one of the most important and imminent New Year's resolutions that must be prioritized and implemented in every school from kindergarten through community centers, as well as be at the core of fall foreign policy for every nation. So human rights education is absolutely crucial as we go forward to ensure a better future for all. Meryl, can you share with us why this issue is so important in international human rights law and how the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, specifically Article 19, is central and core to the global arena? Well, if the children all over the planet, as well as the grown-ups and the elderly people, become aware that the EDHR was written and has been around for 75 years and can grasp the, the depth of what that is for everybody, uh, conceptually and internally, we'll be a better planet as a result. I think it's a very deep, uh, very deep topic because how often do we individually think of the collective, the everybody, and the relationship we have to everybody and the equanimity of everybody? And it's very critical that we learn to do that and uh, become that could become the foundation for humanity uh, that counteracts the divisiveness of of many other um, cultural things. So I think vibrationally, and I'm a musician, of course, so I'm into the vibrational. It's a very important uh, vibration that, that we can collectively create for, the whole, for all of humanity. And not just humanity. Uh, one of the things in, in my experience that happened was uh, a meeting with a pastor, Stephen Hamilton, he said, you know, Meryl, this isn't a, a white man's cut off with a necktie document. You want this to apply to nature as well. And so then we added the line for all creation as a result, because we don't just want human rights for human beings. We want human rights for all of creation to honor the nature as well that's a wonderful point and it's also some of the it was actually the awarding of the human rights award this year was actually to the coalition on december 10th to the group that organized for the right to a clean healthy and sustainable environment so it went to indigenous peoples youth uh center for international environmental law international Union treaty council many ngos and people's movements that we're focusing on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And of course, we just wrapped up COP28, and people are mobilizing for COP29 in Azerbaijan. And another point that really is important with what you raised was how we see the rights of nature being enshrined in national courts. And you even see the rights of rivers in Wanganui and Aotearoa, and also the rights of mountains being declared and created. So really excellent to create this expansion, but to make sure that we understand the interdependence, especially when we see the world we live in today. Kirsten, can you expand a bit on that incredible introduction by our dear colleague there? I would love to. Um, we can, I love that we can expand kind of infinitely on the EDHR. Um, even with 30 articles, which seems like a lot, um, it, after 75 years, we just understand what an incredibly um, infinitely um, mineable idea this is to, to continue to look for and explore what it really means to have rights and um, universally that, that everyone should have. But coming, coming down to Article um, 19 here, 
it's just uh, they're all. I have a lot of favorites, and this is definitely <laughs> among them. Um, where everyone has a right to freedom of opinion and expression, and um, it's very powerful, um, especially with a lot of the politics that are going on right now. You know, just not in, not just governments who are wanting um, more and more control and authoritarianism, but um, but also businesses and corporations that have to have that that need to have their their idea and their way of expressing things out there in order to survive. What we're really talking about is the survival of human beings. And when we come back down to the idea that human beings all have the right to freedom of opinion and expression, um, that is just the beginning because it it asks us to wonder what, um, what opinion is and what expression is. You know, we have a lot of people in the world right now who um, believe that opinions are facts. <laughs> and uh, everybody has a right to their own opinion, but not to change the facts. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, and, and in terms of expression, you know, it's like who has the right to express their, their thoughts, their feelings, um, their ideas? Um, so Meryl and I are both artists, which is why we really gravitate to this, this particular article, um, because that's the work that we do is trying to express things that are more than, um, that are more than someone's agenda. Wonderful. Maybe we can look at first, what inspired you, Meryl, to care about this issue and some of the first campaigns you're involved in around Article 19? Well, I had never heard of the UDHR till I was 33 years old. And a uh, fellow, um, I'll always remember, Dr. Carl Schmidhausler called me up one day. He goes, hey, do you have anything for human rights? Uh, and I had never heard of it. So I said, uh, I don't, but I have a lot of peace music. Why don't you come over to my house? We can talk about it. I'll show you what I have. And we can talk about what you're looking for. And he, you know, was in a hurry to get to another meeting when he left. And I said, by the way, what is this human rights thing? And he goes, oh, you know, like the right to have food and shelter and education. And I'm going, I don't know. And, and I was 33 years old. So what happened later was my dad and I went to the Nutley Public Library and researched and found the document uh, in the somewhere in the library, and he paid ten cents a page to copy it. And I had this document in my piano bench for several years. Every now and then, I'd put it up on the uh, where you put the sheet music and look at it and think about it. And it was like, how could anybody set this thing to music? Was a real big um, dilemma. It was a real challenge because it's all legalistic things uh, in the writing of it. But I was uh, inspired to write every man, woman, and child uh, because I, I sort of boiled it down into uh, how do you put this in a simple ballad? Um, we hold these truths, only we can make more evident. It's like it's, it's in us, and it's up to us to bring it forward, which there you go. If it's in us and we know it innately, and, and only we can make it more evident, that's expression. We can bring it forward from within ourselves. Um, every living soul is worthy of a deep respect. And that's what I wrote. So it just seemed like very obvious truth and yet not obvious enough. And there wasn't really a, um, a blueprint when I was writing the song and going out and teaching it in schools, it wasn't a space anywhere for human rights education. But as a mom, I had to barter for my son's uh, whatever uh, after school or summer camp, or you know, I would just offer my services because I couldn't afford the tuition. And so that's kind of where all this evolved was the, the mother of necessity, the mother of invention. Thank you so much. And then getting to Kirsten, 
What inspired you to care about this issue and some of the first campaigns you were involved in? <laughs> well, I have to say that um, the the person who inspired me most was Meryl. Um, cause I, I had known about human rights, but when I met her, when she walked into my, my office, um, and asked for help with this, you know, I had never met anyone who had dedicated so much to, um, to teaching other people about, about peace. She's an amazing peace activist and in, in terms a musical peak peace activist, and she would write songs for children. And I met her about 10 years after she had taken a choir of children from about five Oakland schools to in New York to perform her song at the, at the General Assembly of the, of the UN. I was so moved to see how a, a young woman could commit herself to educating others through music because um, it's so difficult to be an artist. It's so difficult to claim your space. It's so difficult to get recognition and respect. Um, it's difficult to perform at a level of excellence. And to see that Meryl, um, just as a regular person like me, when educated woman, um, could, could take what she, what was inside of her and teach people that to bring out what's inside of them was so inspiring and to really focus on this document. And the more that I learned about it, the more inspired I became and the more excited I became to be part of a project. So this is about, um, it's, it's about 30, 40 years since, since she created this song, this beautiful song. It was one of, um, I think it was like the first grassroots musical expression of the UDHR. And so I see Meryl as this pioneer in kind of breaking the way open for so many expressions of the UDHR, so many paraphrasings of it. Um, she was pretty much, the, I believe, the first person to do that with Elsa Stamatopoulou. Um, and who took the 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 workshop that she had done with these school children in which they started thinking about human rights and what that meant and then to align their um their ideas with the UDHR and to create a song that anybody could perform and engage with um all of these texts and all of these articles uh, in their own community through music, which is so emotional. So that's my biggest inspiration. That's <laughs> great. Herself. And I'm so honored to work with her on this project and I'm very excited to be here. Well, and it's also great to hear the name Elsa because we've worked a great deal at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues as we focused on the right of nature and looked at Indigenous people's rights. We're actually upholding many of those aspects of protecting each other, but also our planet, a concept we know here in Hawaii is Malama Honua. And so mm -hmm. it's an honor to be able to see the connections, to see how really the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has brought people together and how we've been able to weave around the world in a way a new voice that allows many people to really share how these articles mean so much to them and how they're able to then take articles and actually actualize them in certain ways. And you're Creative curriculum through freedom of expression is essential for a new way forward to save our world. And Article 19, but also Article 26, combined together to transform global affairs, inspiring people to protect each other and our island Earth. And the UDHR provides that power of ideas to initiate change in many countries and through global civil society. As we look at this, maybe this New Year's resolution must be received as a priority for all of humanity. Can you share with us how you actualize this article and what actions you're involved with, beginning with that song, but then what you're doing today as well? I want to share something about the high school orchestration and the professional orchestration of the song, because uh, one of the things that I've been doing recently is sending uh, orchestrated uh, scores to conductors around country around the planet who perhaps might be interested in having their orchestra perform the piece and that's my goal for the 
for the coming years to share what I have, the materials that I have. So I had sent, um, well, also there's a link that I've been sharing with people. We had the world premiere of the high school orchestra last spring at a local school where I was working. And it's, and the, the children at the school are multilingual. And I love that you can always, because the document is the most translated of all the documents on the planet. And you can have students in a group who speak Vietnamese and Ethiopian and all kinds of exotic languages that we incorporated into that performance. So I, I've been happy to share the link to that with the high school orchestra premiere and want to get uh, just more and more high school orchestras. And one of the things that, that came as a realization of that event was that the social studies teachers were packed with other curriculum they could not fit it into their classrooms. The administrator who helped me create the world premiere of the orchestration said no. You cannot go knocking on the doors of my history department, my social studies department, my English department. You can only work with the music department. So I realized that the, the beauty of the song is if you don't have space in a curricula for an educational institution to add, and it's very sad, I would want that every institution that has social studies or any kind of thing that it's relatable to uh, would incorporate that into their curricula. But if it doesn't happen this year, uh, at least they could sing a song and the musicians out there, hey musicians, hey artists, hey dancers, <laughs> come on, take it up. You know, we can express this. We could, we could get it on a program. We could sing it for the PTA. We could go out in the community, sing it at the mayor's office. So there you go. Thank you so much. And Kristen, can you share a bit how you're actualizing this important article and how important it is in our communities these days? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, specifically to focus on what you're saying about a New Year's Year's resolution, a New Year's resolution to make human rights education front and center, to bring it around. Um, The... uh, we're we're absolutely working on that. We're taking this song and expanding it and and doing exactly as Meryl said, is making it a completely accessible piece of music to engage in so that it can sort of build a bridge. You know, there the the human rights education is really taking a huge leap forward in the world right now. Um trying to create, you know, make human rights education part of every school curriculum as it should be. But until we get there, exactly as Meryl says, we need these tools to to show the community, to show the world how important it is and how um, how beneficial it is. Um, I haven't, I wrote a book um, about bullying uh, called The Bullying Antidote, it's right behind me here. And in that I discovered, I did a lot of research and found out that the one um, like the, the thing that always works in bullying, anti-bullying education is to engage the whole community in a discussion of human rights. Because once you have everybody really thinking toward what, you know, what human rights are and how we give them to each other, you, 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 you're missing the whole point. You know, you're, you're just working on symptoms instead of causes. So, um, so just as Meryl said, um, the, the, the power of the universality of this document where it's in all these different languages, and she used the word exotic, but we don't use that anymore because that means like strange and foreign, but any country, every language is exotic to someone, and even English is exotic to some people, but this song, which is published in English, it creates a space for um, writing, for reading in all languages. And uh, Meryl invites musicians from around the world to make their own recordings of this song um, in whatever languages they have. So there's, there's this huge opening, um, these, these empty spaces where we can be talking about human rights. Um, I, I'm putting a link to the, uh, the page where people can see the resources available. You can teach 
human rights in a yoga class. I teach them in my Zumba class. You know, there's so many places that music can access that regular curriculum can't. Really good points. And as you describe it, it reminds me of uh, how I actually spent uh, December 10th on Human Rights Day this year. And it was actually at a concert after a long day of negotiations at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP. And in that meeting, there was a brief concert, and it was the drummer of Guns N' Roses, which you probably would never think would be the human rights one. But they were singing the song Knocking on Heaven's Door, mm -hmm. talking about a way that we get to a new realm of reality where the world would be better. And he would hold the mic into the audience. And the first voice that came out was a young indigenous woman from the Amazon because he's working a lot on protecting nature and focusing on our lungs of the planet in the Amazon. So she sang it in the Yanomami language. And then over 40 different people sang knocking on heaven's door as he handed the mic around the crowd. So it's one of those examples of what you're sharing though, but as you're saying, the universality of the UDHR, because the UDHR has been translated over 500 languages, even Olelo Hawaii as well. We worked on that with educators. And as you're saying, having those discussions, discussing what these rights mean and how we are actually making sure we actualize the articles is so crucial. And there's a great Bob Marley quote as well that says, the greatness of a person is not how much wealth one acquires, but in one's integrity and one's ability to affect those around one positively. And I think that really is what the UDHR is. It's that collective aspect of how we can work together to make sure that all these rights become a reality in everyone's daily living. And many New Year's resolutions receive priority for a brief moment, but peace and human rights education requires a new commitment to the promise for this resolution for a moral revolution. And I think Article 19 focuses on everyone has that right to freedom of opinion as you've been sharing. Maybe you could share a bit some other NGOs you think that are great champions that you've seen that are very creative in human rights education and around Article 19. Marif, that has that. And then we can move into our final part about our personal visions for the future of this important right. Well, I think we're with the HRE USA with Christy and um, Haley, and uh, they've been very active and it's wonderful to be a part of that group as the human rights educators of the United States of America. And also Felisa Tivitz with the HREA, the Human Rights Educators Association. And uh, I wasn't aware of all these groups until 2003. And just historically as a reference, I was doing this work in 1986. That's when I started working on my song and getting performances of it. And our show at the United Nations on Human Rights Day was 1987. And then after that, I worked with Elsa on the paraphrase chart for about a year. And then we did something in 1988 in San Francisco for Amnesty International. Many years went by where it seemed like there wasn't anybody interested, so I didn't push it. But then in 2003, I came across an event in New York hosted by Amnesty International, which was a gathering. And my dear husband sent me as a supportive gift to New York so I could attend. And there were people there that all were working in this human rights education field that had come up since the time that, that I was, you know, sort of giving up on it all. And then I met Felisa Tibbetts, and I met a woman I, um, oh yeah, Nancy Flowers was at that event. Yeah, and people that I've been connected with ever since then, that it's very exciting to know that there's been these movements that have gotten going and that uh, get into schools as they're capable of, and they have workshops and they have trainings and they have all kinds of wonderful opportunities for people to get involved and be part of a bigger community. So anyway, that's just something I'm grateful for. Thank you so much. And really all the people you're mentioning are really the goddesses of good human rights education. You see HRE USA, but Felisa is unbelievable in the work that she does out of Columbia Teachers College and Nancy Flowers. Anytime I'm in San Francisco, 
always go there to meet with her and get inspiration. And definitely we've done a lot of work in San Francisco, but also in New York. So covering both coasts to make sure the world is aware of those 30 articles at the UDHR, not just on the 75th, but on a daily basis. Yeah. Moving now to Kirsten, maybe you can share as well some champions you're aware of. <laughs> I, I wish I had um, known you were going to ask this question because there's so many that I can think of. And I'm specifically thinking of like a lot of youth powered movements right now and indigenous rights movements. And, I, you know, I'm just I think about the water, the, the water keepers and and the sunshine move, youth. And um, and um, I I. And, and all of the all the people working in education, there's so many great. Not, I mean, I'm in Oakland, California, and I can't even. And, and the list is as long as my arm about the people who are working to do good here. And um, um, Segorite Land Trust is getting a lot of mention internationally, and I'm so proud to be able to work with them. Um, but uh, I know we're out of time, and I just wanted to say that I hope in, um, you know, next year or the cop after that, people will be singing Every Man, Woman, and Child all together, or Every Living Soul, which is the, uh, the non-gendered um, version of this, of this song. Um, and check it out. It's just really beautiful, and it's just the beginning for um, what we can start to do and sing about and feel and accomplish together. Thank you so much. And that really is important because it actually looks at the important movements such as 350.org. I know of Oakland course, just yes. has a new new Hmong mayor and we just celebrated mm -hmm. Hmong New Year. So Hmong culture and rights, absolutely crucial, but it's great to see a Hmong mayor in Oakland. So it's exciting to see how dynamic and how that Hmong mayor will actually bring human rights to reality to be the voice for people that maybe haven't been heard for a long time. And that's why Article 18 is so crucial. It's one of the most important rights in the world. It focuses on everyone who has that right to freedom of opinion and expression. It includes that freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media, especially music, which is so powerful, and beyond all the frontiers. So I thank you both for joining. Uh, this has been Cooper Union on Think Tech Hawaii. And it's an honor to host this show. We'll see you again next week. And thank you so much for watching. And I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. Aloha and aole makahikiho. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm.